What's up everyone, Lance Hedrick here, and today we're talking about this piece of art. Now this machine has an interesting history. It goes back a little over a decade actually to when the creator, Wuther Streetman, created this while he was still in university. So he made the first kind of prototype as a school project and he took it to a fair in 2011, an, a coffee expo. And there he learned a lot more about coffee extraction and a lot of other things that he needed to work on and he came back a year later in 2012 with a more permanent design. So this has been around for about 12 years in a more final form, I guess you could say, but he's obviously tweaked it over the years as we're now to a different model. It is one of those type of legacy items or heirloom type things where you'll keep for a long time due to its quality of build and simplicity of makeup. What is this machine? Well, it's a simple direct lever machine with an open boiler on top and a saturated group with a PID controller. That's about it. Of course, that's not taking into account the quality of materials that go into making this as well as how small of a scale the company is up in Holland. There's brass on here, there's copper on here, there's stainless steel on here, and there's a lot of different types of wood that you can choose in order to kind of finish out your design. And the idea was for it to be a true work of art that is also functional. One of my favorite designs of a lever machine has to be that Vorlex that I show in the, the Mumak video where you can hang the Fema up on the wall and pull espresso that way. They were housed on trains and in different areas and it's something that I would still love to get my hands on but have not been able to find one of the originals. Well, the Streetman used to have the capability of being mounted on a wall as well. I believe the ES2 and the ES3 versions both were mountable. And so there's actually videos you can find on YouTube from a decade ago where it was mounted on a wall and you see Wouter walk, walking through the whole process of pulling espresso with that wall mounted version of this. We're now at the CT2 in this in its full glory and he's now making batches of up to about a hundred at a time. And so as he's scaling up, he's able to get tighter tolerances and make them even better with quality. Now what's interesting is I watched an interview with the creator of this machine and he said that some of his early success was pretty much due specifically to the Home Barista Forum online. A lot of his sales, the bulk of his sales, would go to the USA where a lot of these people were participating in this Home Barista Forum. They saw his craftsmanship and his dedication to the craft of espresso and they wanted to support it. And so over the years he's been able to grow because of this impetus desire from this unusual group of coffee weirdos, which is still going on today and I take part in every now and then. This machine is built to the highest of quality as possible and you have to order in advance so that they can get it made for you and shipped out. I ordered mine in I believe October or November and I got it delivered in January. So I've had it now for about seven months and I've been pulling some absolutely incredible espresso with it. Now I've been taking a while to make this video because I first wanted to release my most recent video, which we'll link right above, which is the 49 millimeter versus 58 millimeter basket data-driven video. There's not really many 49 millimeter options on the market, and a lot of people, for whatever reason, see smaller diameters as inferior. Now, my preference does tend to lie with smaller diameter baskets, not because of the diameter, but because of the depth and the aspect ratio that can be achieved with a smaller diameter without using an ungodly amount of coffee. If I take a 58 and I achieve the same aspect ratio, I'd be doing 35 gram doses. I don't want that big of an espresso shot. When I use a 13 or 14 gram dose, that's giving me a 35, if I want 35 gram shot of espresso, which is perfect for me. That's what I want so I can have a few a day and not be ridiculously over caffeinated. If I had a basket of the same depth to diameter ratio with this, I'm drinking 120 grams of coffee a day, which is a ridiculous amount of whole bean to grind up and drink. That's like almost half a bag of coffee. The reason I wanted to do that first was because I didn't want to just pull this out and sing the praises of the espresso I get from this without at least a little data backing it up to show that it's not just me being smitten with the design of the machine, which full transparency, I am. I absolutely am in love with the espresso that it pulls. So it sports a 49 millimeter basket. Now, when we compare that to something like a modern 58 millimeter basket, it is worlds different as far as size goes. Teeny tiny, 
versus huge. Now the depth on this specific basket is about the same as on the 58, but the difference is in the aspect ratio, so diameter times depth, and that's what my previous video really looked at was this aspect ratio, so the depth by the diameter. So the depth of these 49 millimeter baskets are much, much, much more so deep than on the 58, which is a much more shallow and thin puck, comparatively speaking, to the diameter, which is a very important measurement and something to take into account. In order to match the depth of this, the 49 millimeter basket with the 58, it would need to essentially, not double, but go like 30% deeper in size. So I really enjoy the deeper pucks, relatively speaking, and I found that to make an incredible style of espresso that I enjoy with a lot of acidity when you're using the right coffees, but it can also provide you with an incredible mouthfeel. It can get you really syrupy texture if that's what you're wanting. It can get you really balanced cups with barely any bitterness essentially ever. In fact, I, this is one of the few times I say it's hard to pull a bad shot with this machine. It's similar to my enjoyment of like a La Pavone and a Cremina in the sense that if you know how to temperature surf it well or manage the temperature, the thermal properties of those machines because they're closed boilers, you get incredible coffee. But because you have to do all that thermal management, it's a little bit more difficult and there's a big learning curve for a lot of people on those machines. Now with this machine, the reason that learning curve is not there is because it is PID controlled. In fact, on the back part of this machine, you have a knob that goes from 80 degrees Celsius up to 96 degrees Celsius, which is honestly like a fantastic window for any type of coffee. So whenever I do decaf coffees on here, I can go down to 80 or 81, 82, which is where I kind of prefer uh, when it comes to espresso with decaf, maybe 83, 84, somewhere around there. But then you can go all the way up to 96 if you have a super lightly roasted coffee. Now, because the boiler is kind of here and the group head here, it's technically a saturated group where the boiler and the group are one piece. So you have a really nice thermal stability that occurs in here. And in fact, if you do temperature testing on what water temperature is at the puck, you'll get essentially what you've set it at is the water temp at the puck because that's where it's reading it. And then as it's going through to the ending, if you measure the temperature at the very end inside that puck, you're getting maybe a one to three degree decrease in temperature depending on the length of your pool. You turn it on, it takes eight to 11 minutes or so to fully heat up. If you wanna make sure everything's perfectly hot, including the hunk of a portafilter, I guess you could wait maybe 14 or 15 minutes, but in reality, you don't need to wait that long. I've not needed to wait that long for any, even the lightest of coffees. You're able to kind of just go. So you're not having to mess around with um, all, all these different boilers and all these different mechanisms, an overpressure valve, uh, a lot of different wires inside with a vibration pump or a rotary pump. You have simply a piston inside and you have the components for the PID controller, which are very simply put together, and it's been a similar design since the beginning, so there's very few things that could ever go wrong. Now, on top of all that, you have a nice long lever, which allows for a really easy pull whenever you're getting up to nine bar. It doesn't take you know two arms, or it's not something you have to put all your body weight behind. It comes down really simple because of that ergonomic design of the lever itself, making things very easy. Now, of course, there are negatives about it, uh, I guess perceived negatives, things that a lot of people will get Get annoyed by, which is a teeny tiny clearance of the drip tray. Of course, when he started, he wanted this big base just to make things easy so he could focus on the group head and the properties there. And so that base is still quite big and it has kind of, it has this tray here, which just, you can move like so. It's a nice piece of copper. But the, the distance between when the pour filter is in with a basket to where the actual cup is, if you grab, you know, a Dimitas type of looking cup, which we'll do here, there's barely any distance for some sort of scale. So if I wanted to put a lunar scale up underneath this, it only just fits without contact, barely. You wouldn't be able to see the shot. You'd be going blindly. But if you, you know, if you get the really expensive Pixis scale, then you're good. You're good to go. It fits much better. This is not a machine for everyone. It simply isn't. The price tag is pretty high. Uh, and when I say it, you know, a lot of you are gonna maybe scoff at it, but it sits around 2,000 or so euros. Uh, so it's a very high price machine because they're made in such small quantities, because of the quality of parts in it, all the brass, all the copper, the stainless steel. And then of course, the fact that it's a, a small team, they have to pay in order to, you know, 
have jobs. So it is a very expensive unit and you have to take into account that it's something that you'll keep for a long time. It's a piece of artwork and it's a talking piece. Essentially, since it's a direct lever machine, you can control the pressure profile however you want. Now it should be noted there is no pressure gauge on this. Now uh, my, my friend Gabor from Smart Espresso Profiler, he does make a, a, a kit so that you can create or put in a pressure gauge into this machine if you're wanting to have that sort of control or kind of follow it. I have found that I don't really need, I just kind of go based off feel and I'm still getting incredible shots. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that pressure can be largely a red herring. So I like to do a pre-infusion, kind of hold it there for a bit as I saturate that puck pretty quickly. I let it sit for a bit and then I continue through with the full extraction, quote unquote, it's extracting the whole time. But uh, that's, that's kind of the approach I'm gonna be taking. I have it set to 95 degrees Celsius, so almost to the full temperature temperature and uh, it's it's ready to go. It's super hot. The portafilter is hot. It's ready to go. So I'm going to grind up coffee and we'll get the shot pulled. Now as we remove the portafilter, as you can see, it's a pretty nice locking mechanism. It's like the opposite of a normal machine where it has the hooks on the outside and it grabs on like so. Gaskets on the inside where the piston is. Pull that right on out. Now the basket comes out really easily. There's no spring or anything holding it in. So you have that. And so a lot of people like to prepare their basket before putting it in. Now, when the when you get the machine, it comes with all these different types of baskets. So you have different sizes, different pull patterns. Um, some of them have mesh on the inside, which can you know change the shot quality, obviously, because it restricts the flow maybe a bit more. Uh, but you have these different sizes and meshes and whatnot that all come with it. There's also a basket that fits from Swarks. Now this one he actually made for the Pico Presso, which I show in my Pico Presso video, but he also sends it with a, a little gasket. When you have this gasket inside, it fits really nicely into here. So you need to have that gasket for it to fit, but uh, there it goes. So we could use that. I'm not going to because it's like a $200 basket. No need to add more expense to it. But anyway, so we have this. I am gonna use the funnel I got from Swarks. You want to be a little swanky. So this kind of clicks onto the little, uh, the edges right here, those little um, phalanges, I guess. So we have that. I'm going to shake up my grounds. And this way I can dump them straight in. Once they're in, I just do some tippy tappy, tippy tappy. A little tap here. Twist and pull off. Then we can tamp away. It's just, there we go. Everything's ready, so we just toss this right in, lock it in, and I'm using my Pixis scale because it fits in order to kind of follow the time, and I'm just going to slowly lift up. Now this is introducing the water into the chamber. You don't want to go up too quickly, so we get that full that full chamber of, of water above the puck, and then I'm just going to push down until I get some resistance, so I know I'm pre-infusing right about here. I'm going to let drips come out until about five grams in the cup, just kind of holding it in place. So we're about three, four, five. Now I'm gonna ramp up, probably at like eight or nine bar right here. Not too worried about it. There is no pressure gauge on here, but I've noticed that I don't really need a pressure gauge to get really nice shots. And I think that's because pressure can largely be a red herring. But uh, here we go anyway. Now, if you pull the lever up too quickly, you won't get enough water into that chamber. Okay, so there we go. It's a little over a one to two. I'm gonna stop the shot. All right. So that was about 45 seconds since we lifted lever, so maybe about a 35 second shot with that pre-infusion. We got about 33 out with a 14 gram dose. Uh, there's still more in the tank. You can probably get a 40, 43, 44 gram shot out of this. Um, in fact, let's just see what's left in there. All right, so you can kind of hold it at the bottom and the kind of excess pressure is gonna push through some more water. There we go. So there's an extra 10 grams there. So you have about a 45-ish gram shot you can pull if you're wanting to. So that's a solid one to three with a 15 gram dose. So that might be overpacking some of these baskets. You can get a bigger basket though if you want to do one to three. But anyway, I did around a one to one to two-ish, a little over one to two. We'll stir that up and have a little sip. It's just hard to pull a bad shot with this. Intense sweetness, really nice acidity, lively acidity, very bouncy, playful acidity. Mouth is watering. That's a really nice shot. And because it's 49 millimeter, you can grind pretty coarse, which means a lot of grinders are able to work with this machine. I actually took this really old, uh, like, super old hand grinder that's used in, as like a, something to clamp on a workbench that a friend sent me a spong s-p-o-n-g and i was able to make espresso with that even though it is some old outdated uh machine with like uh, it was i probably shouldn't have drink the espresso from it but i did 
obviously the question then becomes, well, who is this for? Well, as I've said multiple times, it's for an espresso purist, someone who appreciates the artwork of it and someone who wants to buy something that they'll never need to buy another of again. It's something I have some friends who have uh, sold other machines that they have in order to acquire this because this is something they see that they can hand down to their kids. It's something that'll just last essentially forever. But yeah, price is crazy high. Uh, and it, even for me, it was like, wow, it took me a while to want to buy it. I was told by Claudio at Lever Fever uh, that I needed to get one because he just sang its praises. And so I finally was like, all right, I'll pony up. And I ended up acquiring one, like I said, about seven months ago. There's a funny thing people always say is when you're, you're in coffee long enough, you eventually get a lever. Uh, it, it just makes, it, to me and to a lot of people, it makes a superior espresso experience. And with this, you also get the tactile experience uh, and, and you get the aesthetic experience of using something that's beautiful and that you need to kind of, you don't have to baby it, of course, because this is gonna get age spots and whatnot from water getting on it. and it'll kind of tarnish and it'll give its own character and mine will eventually get a lot of that. I have a few now, but not, not too much because I've been very anal about cleaning it off and it's actually part of my espresso preparation. When I make a coffee, I sit there and I'll wipe it off and it's kind of like if you have an old vintage Porsche or something that you, you know, you're wiping down all the time in order to make sure it's in pristine condition. That's kind of the feeling I get with this machine. It's kind of like having, it's like, it's like your baby, right? The aesthetic can be splitting for some people, but for me, it is right up my alley. I think it looks really good. I think it makes incredible tasting coffee. It, the thermal management is not even a thing. You just use the PID controller and it gives you what you need and put coffee in, you pull it out and it's tasty. It also should be noted that it does come obviously with its own tamper, which is made with the same wood of whatever wood you choose for the handles. So you get a, a tamper that comes with it. And then you also get this kind of leveling device, which is very nicely built. It's very heavy. In fact, about 500 grams. All right. The tamper weighs like 125. So this thing is substantial. I don't use it because I'm not a fan of lever levelers. Um, so honestly, they could have just left this out for me, but uh, I'm sure there's some people out there that may want to use it. You have on the lever arm itself the connection to the piston, which is a bent stainless steel rod. As you lift this piston up, it fills the chamber with water. So right now the chamber is obviously empty because the piston's all the way down. But then as we lift it, it replaces that part of the chamber with the water. So you want to go up slowly. If you go up too quickly, you won't get enough water in that chamber. So you go up pretty slowly like so, boom. Now we're fully torqued and we're ready to go. We've replaced the dead space, or I guess it's not dead space since the piston was there, but we've essentially just transported the water from above the piston to below the piston. And then we start pushing down. This curved piece of rod is connected directly, obviously to the piston itself. You start pushing and that piston goes down with it. So there you have it. And of course, this is connected by these two little thumb screws right here. In order to get the handle on and off, there are two grub screws right below here. So when it comes in the mail or however you get it, uh, it's a simple assembly to put together. Like me, he was very much inspired by all of these small espresso machines being manufactured in Italy in the 1950s, and he had his own little collection. I can't help but notice some of the similarities with the original, which was by Achille in 1952 with the Gilda, which again, I have tattooed right here, which was a piston-driven uh, lever machine, direct lever. Now that one was much more difficult to, to work with, but what he did is he bought all these machines as he was collecting them and was taking them apart, putting them back together with love and was figuring out where the issues were over time in order to fix them. And so this is kind of what he came up with over the past, I guess, 13 years now, or even more, depending on how long he worked on it in school. And I think it is a testament to passion and to creativity and to just, uh, just pure craftsmanship that has allowed this to kind of come to where it is today. If this is something you're into, it definitely has my stamp of approval, but I also understand that the vast majority of people are not gonna be into this because of the price point on it. You can get something with a similar group head at a fraction of the cost, like a Flare Neo or something along those lines. Uh, yeah, I'm a big fan, and um, this is gonna make a lot of my espressos because it's so easy. It's kind of like my, my feelings with a V60 and filter. I kind of just toss a filter in a V60 and brew on with my simple recipe. With this, genuinely, if I know a rough grind size range, I can toss coffee in and I'm gonna get something good out. And it's just, it's a fantastic thing. You like it or you don't like it, I'm excited to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Is this something you wish there was a, a, like a cheaper version of? I don't know how 
you could achieve maybe the same quality, but you probably could at around $1,000 with a much more mass uh, production. You're buying art along with the functional aspect of it. So if you're interested in my content, I would love a like and a subscribe. Check out the Patreon, the second YouTube, all that good stuff. But other than that, I hope that you brew something tasty today, kind of like I did. And cheers.